Of course. Um, thank you, Rodrigo. Um, good morning. It is my honor to present Dr. Brown for Grand Round this morning. Dr. Brown is, an, if you can go to the next slide. He is an assistant clinical investigator and head of the neurosurgical oncology unit at the NINDS NIH. Originally from Jamaica, he moved to the US after completing high school. At the undergraduate level, Dr. Brown studied chemistry and biochemistry and obtained a Bachelor of Science with honors. He then completed a Master of Science in Biochemistry and Biophysics at Temple University School of Medicine. Dr. Brown then matriculated in the joint Rogers, Robert Wood Johnson and Princeton, Princeton University MD PhD program, earning a PhD in molecular biology and neuroscience, and was the recipient of an NIH F30 award, as well as a pre-doctoral research fellowship from the New Jersey Commission of Cancer Research. He then completed residency in, in neurological surgery with a fellowship in neuros neurosurgical oncology at the Mayo Clinic in 2021 spending some time here with Dr. Q and Dr. Chaichana as well. Additionally, he has received multiple awards, as you can see, such as the Resident Research Award at Mayo Clinic and the Best Paper Award at CNS and many others. If we can go to the next. Additional to his clinical practice in brain tumors, Dr. Brown has his own laboratory at the NIH, where they study the primary cilium as a site of integration of key, key, key signaling pathways for brain tumors specifically for glioblastoma. If we can go to the next, as you can see, Dr. Brown has many uh, very important publications and important contributions to the field of neuro-oncology and neurosurgery. And Dr. Brown, if we can go to the next, we are very much looking forward to your talk, talk titled Primary Cilia Exploitable Glioblastoma Signaling Pops. This is a plaque that we uh, made for you and we will send your way to thank you for being uh, with us this morning. Uh, we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for being here with us. And Desmond, so from much. on behalf of ourselves, our faculty, our residents, you know, and all our patients, we thank you immensely. Kai and I had an amazing time interacting with you when you came to rotate with us, and we've been following your career. So amazing at the NIH, the work that you're doing. I know that we're collaborating right now, sending back and forth sales information. I know Paolo has been in the middle of this. So it's been a pleasure to see you, to meet with you at your meetings, to get to know your laboratory, to get to know the work you're doing, to get to know your family, which is another amazing you know, thing. Okay, congratulations to you and your family, your wife, your children, everybody who has made this possible. Kai, you wanna say a few words too? Oh yeah, it's a great accomplishment uh, that you've done so far and we expect a lot from you. Um, it was great, like Q said, to have you when you were a, a PGY5, PGY6 here. We did a lot of cases, I think over a hundred cases or so, at least with me and then another hundred probably with Q, so. Thank you very much. That was uh, one of the highlights of residency for me. Thank you, Des, take it away. And thank right. you, Rodri, for everything. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for being here. You can uh, maybe share your screen. All right, are you seeing my, my screen? We see it, yes. uh, looks okay. great. Great, okay, so I'll try to um, get through this and give you a taste for what we've been working on in, in our laboratory and what we hope to be um, uh, contributing to over the next uh, few years uh, while here. So the title of the talk is Primary Cilia Exploitable Glioblastoma Signaling Hubs. <clears throat> I have no disclosures relevant to the talk, um, and these are the uh, objectives for this talk. Uh, I'm going to skip this section in the interest of time, and uh, mostly when I give this talk, um, you know, the primary cilium is uh, such a sort of uh, esoteric topic within cell biology that I find I need to spend some time giving a, a, a pretty good introduction so we're all up to speed. But essentially, primary cilia were kind of considered the appendix of the cell, right? They're, they're there. Nobody really knows what they did. And they've, they've been noted on the cell um, since the early 1900s, but really not until about 1962 that there was evidence that perhaps every single cell actually has one of these things. Um, and then... Uh, we started learning and understanding some of the structure function relationships. So 
When I talk of primary cilia, I am not referring to the motile cilia that most of us learned about in medical school with the nine plus two uh, arrangement with that central doublet. This is a nine plus zero arrangement. These are immotile cilia. And this is gonna become important. So I want you to understand that the primary cilium grows out of that mother centriole. Um, so out of the centrosome. And then it's uh, essentially as the exoneme grows, there's an outpouching of the, of the membrane, which becomes um, the, um, uh, the axonemal membrane after uh, quite a number of modifications. Um, and, uh, and this leads to a number of very important structure and functional relationships that um, I'll talk about. Uh, this is a, an electron micrograph that I captured uh, some years ago. Um, kind of looking at this, you can see the mother and daughter central because they're perpendicular. You get them in different planes and you can see the exiting growing out of it. So the regulation of primary cilia, as you can imagine, if this thing is growing out of the centrosome, um, then you can understand uh, quite easily that there are implications for, for example, cell cycling. So actually primary cilia almost act as a physical checkpoint inhibitor to the G2M transition. And so in a normal functioning cell, um, normally in quotes, of course, you know, you spend quite a lot of ATP building this every G0, G1S, and then breaking it down so that the cell can go and enter mitosis every single cycle. So quite a lot of your cells ATP is actually devoted to this process. Uh, this is some uh, images we captured in the lab. You can see at anaphase or you know, telokinesis, for example, here you can see the centrosome uh, labeled here in pericentrin without the axoneme growing from this, which allows this process to occur. So, you know, when I was in graduate school, one of my advisors, uh, uh, Eric Wieschow, said, won the Nobel Prize for uh, discovering uh, sonic hedgehog signaling. And sonic hedgehog signaling is the sort of prototypical pathway uh, that relies on the primary cilium. So essentially the way that works is that there is a receptor called patch, which is the sonic hedgehog receptor. And that receptor tonically binds to smooth end um, and prevents smooth end from going up into the primary cilium. When sonic hedgehog binds to patch, smooth end is released, and then it can trans, uh, go up into the primary cilium where it gets activated and then subsequently activates the so-called glioma proteins, which are the downstream signaling proteins of hedgehog signaling. Um, and so, of course, when primary cilia um, are absent, then this activation of smooth end can occur and the pathway is turned down or off. Um, since that time, though, many of the canonical signaling pathways that we know, we, we now understand are dependent on primary cilia. And what's really interesting here is that in the case of hedgehog, for example, the, the, the primary cilia are required for signal transduction of the, of the pathway. But for example, WINT, because of inversin, which is a tonic inhibitor of beta catenin when primary cilia are present, um, the wind pathway is down, right? And so you can understand that the presence, the absence, the function of this organelle uh, acts as this sort of global regulator that can fine tune a number of these canonical signaling pathways that are important in both development, uh, as in wind and hedgehog and many of these, but also in cancer, um, which uh, as you guys know, many of these um, developmental pathways are the pathways that um, are uh, abnormal um, in cancer. And so, you know, unsurprisingly then, you have a number of diseases that result when primary cilia um, are dysfunctional. Um, and so these uh, together are termed ciliopathies, and many of them are diseases that many in the audience have heard about, like retinitis pigmentosa or polycystic kidney disease, et cetera. This is one that we published some years ago uh, from a founder family in Germany. And we were able to show that really just one of these intraflagellar tr uh, transport proteins, FT122, um, which was uh, abnormal in this family, 
essentially led to the cilia being fewer and shorter. And that was enough to lead to these uh, really terrible um, uh, uh, syndrome, uh, Sensenbrenner syndrome or craniectal uh, ectodermal dysplasia. So, you know, how did this all begin? So, you know, when I, when I started in the lab many years ago, um, you know, we learned about, you know, this uh, protein called broad-minded, um, which seemed to stabilize um, or stabilized by this other protein, CCRK. And in these mutants, you know, the cilia, this is a zebrafish morpholino. You could see how the cilia are abnormal here. Um, and so, you know, I ended up making the first uh, knockout mouse of uh, CCRK, cell cycle related kinase, which is now called CDK20. And if there are any developmental biologists in the audience, what you are going to realize is that the knockout mouse here, uh, essentially has a phenotype that looks very much like a hedgehog mouse. There's polysyndactyly, there's uh, absence of a midline brain furrow, there's exencephaly, uh, really classic sonic hedgehog phenotype, which is not what was expected from, you know, a protein which essentially is uh, near identical to other CDKs. So we worked to characterize this, and I'll try to go through this part quickly here, but what we found was essentially what this did was led to dorsalization of the neural tube, much like you would see in a sonic hedgehog mouse. So you can see ventralization of PAC6. Um, you can see that you know the hedgehog signaling uh, from the floor plate just isn't taking off. And if you remember from medical school, yeah, um, sonic hedgehog sets up this concentration gradient. So the cells, um, these um, interneurons here that are, are um, early interneurons that haven't decided their fate yet, they integrate the concentration and time over which they see hedgehog signaling and then fate switch based on that. So here, what you can see is that the cells, it's as if they're seeing less hedgehog signaling. And we could uh, prove this biochemically in a number of ways. And I'm gonna uh, try to move quickly through this. Ultimately, what I was able to show was that the CCRK mutants have these dysmorphic um, and dysfunctional um, primary cilia um, in the neuroepithelium of the mouse. Uh, and that could explain why we're seeing uh, this hedgehog signaling. Um, and I'll keep going. So, you know, fast forward uh, deep into residency, and I'm thinking about, um, you know, uh, transitioning into having my own lab and, and into a postdoctoral fellowship, et cetera. And um, really reading and thinking about projects you know, at this point, you know, it, it became clear that, you know, CCRK is an oncogene in several um, human cancers, but particularly in gliomas, which, um, you know, was uh, somewhat serendipitous, um, but also very interesting. So as you know, um, you know, glioblastoma is a uniformly fatal disease. Um, you know, it's the most common primary uh, malignant brain tumor, um, poor survival. It's uniformly fatal, as I said, and a 6.8% uh, five-year survival. This is a lady that I treated here at, um, uh, at, uh, at NIH, uh, 46 years old with a 14-year-old, um, turned out to have a very, um, uh, a rare uh, small cell variant, which is pretty aggressive uh, form of GBM. And uh, despite the Herculean efforts and so on, she didn't survive uh, very long. And this is uh, very much the, uh, the story that we often see uh, with uh, glioblastoma. Um, so, so this is a specimen um, that we uh, took from our lab, uh, sorry, from the operating room. Uh, and then brought to the lab an image on, on our confocal. And you can see this is uh, you know, a real patient. Uh, you can see again, this is the nucleus stained here in DAPI. This is the centrosome stained with pericentrin. And you can see the primary cilia growing out of that mother centriole um, in, in the acetylated alpha tubulin. So this is uh, applies to real patients um, and real patient samples. Um, so in our work in the lab, we look at, you know, primary cilia in glioblastoma, and we think about because of all the different pathways that it regulates, there are pathways that touch on several of the, um, 
I guess, the phenotypic advantages that a glioblastoma acquires over its lifetime that makes it such a deadly disease. And primary cilia are involved in, in several of these. Um, I'll start by telling you some of the work we've done in silico with some molecular profiling. And if I have time, I'll show you some um, new data with uh, immunosuppression. So this sort of all came um, when, you know, there's a, a group actually out of Rutgers that is not a cilia group at all, um, but instead there are statisticians looking for um, better ways to do by clustering algorithms for large data sets. And so they went to the TCGA and uh, applied their algorithm, which I'm, I'm happy to talk about. And essentially what they found was, you know, there's this uh, set of genes that all seem to be related to this primary cilia. And uh, if you look at, for example, take a look at uh, figure B here from their paper. If you were to look at the, the, the you know, they created this risk score. Um, if you were to look at the top versus the bottom, I mean, you're seeing very vast differences in survival, which is not something we typically see even in successful glioma trials, right? Um, so very huge differences when the patients are stratified by this, uh, by this risk score. And you can see that when they then looked at, you know, um, from these bicluster genes, you know, what, what, sort of functions became um, important within the ciliary genes, you know, things for ciliary movement and assembly and, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, this is uh, looking actually at, you know, um, the, the uh, single cell uh, data, right? So looking at whether you are seeing this in the tumor proper versus in, in the core, uh, in, in the peritumoral area, and you can see that the, the, the data is really from the core of the tumor. So this is something that the tumor itself is doing. So we had a different idea, right? Um, and a very simple idea. But one of the questions we asked was that, you know, I already showed you during the introduction that, you know, primary cilia orchestrate all these different pathways, but it does it in very different ways, right? So not every pathway is turned on by cilia, not every pathway is turned off by cilia, but all these pathways to some degree are at play. And so one of the questions one could have, a hypothesis one could have is that, well, these are so sort of fundamental to biology that if you looked at genes that regulate structural genes, that regulate primary cilium development, you wouldn't really see a difference because kind of like ATP or something, they're just so fundamental to the biology. On the other hand, we understand that glioblastomas are very genetically complex. And therefore, um, many studies have shown that you know, the pathogenic mechanisms on a molecular level that drive some tumors might be very different from the molecular pathogenic mechanisms for other tumors. And therefore one could imagine a scenario where uh, tumors depending on their pathogenic origin might actually use and express um, their primary cilia and the primary cilia genes in very different ways. So we essentially took a curated list of, uh, of genes known to be structurally important for development of the primary cilium. And we blasted this against uh, gliomas in the TCGA. We did that both for high and low grade gliomas. Here I'm showing the low grade glioma data just because there are more and uh, the, the ends were better. The data wasn't um, uh, very different, but I am gonna show the low grade gliomas here just to illustrate my point. And what you can see is that there are you know, four clusters that we were able to, to, to find based solely on expression of these uh, structural ciliary genes. So, you know, big deal. Uh, the big question was, do we see that, you know, patients whose tumors fall in a particular uh, uh, cluster in terms of their ciliary expression, do they behave differently clinically? And so on the left, what I'm showing you is that there is a cluster where the survival is really poor. There's a cluster where the survival is really high. And there, there are some patients that are in between. And these have actually lower 
lower numbers of patients. Um, uh, certainly, uh, the, the mid survival has lower numbers of patients, but there's definitely a high and low survival. Now, if you look on the right at this multivariate analysis, this is the part that was really um, eye-opening because what this says is that on a multivariate analysis, when we actually looked for factors, molecular factors that we all uh, hold to, to, to be prognostic for uh, glioblastomas, things like IDH status and 1P19Q status and age and MGMT status, et cetera, these things did not hold statistical, uh, statistical significance, just the clusters that they were in, which is really amazing. So what this says is that while, you know, the, you know, these, these sort of molecular um, uh, groupings of tumors, um, you know, are might, may be important, there may be a sort of higher level regulation that actually supersedes that such that once you start beginning to think about the tumors in terms of their ciliary clusters, a lot of these things actually lose their statistical significance for predicting outcome, which is a very, um, a very novel and, and, and important finding. So of course, this is just a TCG, and I'm sure all the people in the audience who are familiar with the TCG are saying, well, you know, how representative might that be? And so we thought we'd do this in an orthogonal data set. And so we accessed the, the Chinese glioma um, data set, and we started asking much of the same questions. If we use just structural genes um, that we know regulate primary cilia, um, do we see that they are sort of, um, there's just one type, or do we find clusters? We again found clusters. Um, also for clusters, we found that the clusters um, also showed uh, differences in terms of survival. And again, we found that when we look at things like age and MGMT and IDH status and 1P19Q status, these did not seem to hold survival, uh, sorry, hold any prognostic um, information beyond what we already got from uh, stratifying the tumors based on their ciliary clusters. So then we can take this information and we can ask a lot of really cool questions like, um, so in each of the clusters, and this is just a heat map, by the way, looking at the CGGA, TGGA. And, and for those of you that work with these large data sets, you know, these are done by different uh, sequencing uh, strategies, actually. Uh, very different populations, obviously. So it's really amazing how similar um, these uh, actually look despite all those differences. And we can then go through and start asking questions about what are the, uh, the genes um, that we are, are seeing that are different. Um, and then of course we can do other things like um, start looking at you know what clusters. So for example, looking at now. So if you take um, those different clusters, you can then ask not only what ciliary genes are there, but how did belonging to that particular ciliary cluster change the overall gene expression um, of downstream non-ciliary genes? And so um, that's what this is showing. And we can see that you know, those, you know, and for example, the high surviving clusters, we're seeing lots of genes from both TCGA and C CGGA. Um, that's in the splicing and ribonuclear protein functions, of course, cytoskeleton um, and, and GTPase related functioning. And in the poor surviving clusters, uh, we see lots of things with inflammation, the proteasome, DNA modification, which I'll talk about a little bit, um, and, and so on. Right. And so again, this is just. Uh, looking at this um, now um, do it using an ingenuity pathway analysis um, uh, uh, pathway map. And you can see in the high and low survival clusters, you know, what kind of interesting things start popping out, things about the actin cytoskeleton again, um, versus, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, EGF, ILK, uh, super pathway of cholesterol biosynthesis, which actually um, has been uh, something that's being reported um, over the last five years or so to be really important for glioblastoma uh, prognostication. And we were able to pull this out based solely on our ciliary analysis. Um, <clears throat> so um, the other thing that we were able to, to, to ask was, okay, so now we have all these genes that are regulated differently um, just 
by sorting the tumors based on their regulation of um, their, their, their uh, ciliary clusters. Um, and so do we see differences in methylation? And so now what this is saying is that just looking at the high and the low surviving clusters, we can see complete separation on the methylome uh, of these clusters, um, which is unrelated to things like IDH status uh, and MGMT and so on and so forth, which is, which is how we would otherwise be classifying these. And so, um, you know, again, we can, we can see very sharp distinctions between uh, genes um, uh, in, in our top 50 ciliary genes and then the top 50 downstream genes from that overall that separate or high versus our low surviving clusters. Uh, so um, I'm seem like I'm running out of time here. So I'll just try to show you this part really quickly. So what we then did was from patients that I operated on, we wanted to get a sense of whether uh, two things. One, do we see these kinds of changes um, on real life human patients? And two, um, can we start to work on developing some sort of prospective uh, segregation of these patients so that we can then begin to understand um, on this sort of higher level um, what that means for patients. And so what we've done here is we've taken tissue blocks uh, from these patients I operated on and then did geospatial uh, sequencing looking to see in the tumor core, can we see these differential expression um, of, of these genes when we compare different uh, tumor types, for example. Here I'm just showing versus oligodendrogliomas versus uh, IDH wild type uh, glioblastoma or IDH mutant. And we can see some of, for example, the kinesin motor genes. We can see uh, sex 61 a very differential expression of ciliary genes are some of the most um, differentially expressed genes that we can get popping out from this. So to summarize this part, ciliary gene expression uh, is differentially regulated across glioma subtypes. Gliomas with different ciliary clusters show statistically significant differences in survival, and this is independent uh, for currently accepted molecular prognosticators. And uh, based on this, we think that uh, and of course, much other information that I'm not able to show right now, that primary cilia might actually act as this master regulator that controls multiple signaling pathways that are of pathophysiological relevance in gliomas. And of course, you know, we all have the, the sort of horror stories of, you know, you find a really great target, um, like EGFR amplification, you find a really great drug for that target. Um, it works really well in, in a mice, for example, but then in the patients, uh, you know, they mutate away, um, they're spread, uh, and, and this doesn't work. The goal here is that by being able to target at the organelle level, um, we might be able to change multiple, multiple downstream pathways that are all necessary, necessary for the tumor and might create a situation where the tumor doesn't have the genetic ability to escape from multiple targets at the same time through targeting through the organelle. And so that is the general goal and gist of what we work on, just to give you a taste. It appears that I'm out of time, so I will not go into the work uh, that we uh, have just generated uh, looking at uh, uh, glioblastoma-mediated immunosuppression. I'll stop here and take any questions. Thank you. So this, maybe we save that for part two of a talk in the next few months, you know, where you have done, but maybe I just kick it off with a question. Of course, um, it is amazing to see and to think about this cilia therapy. I think that your data pretty convincingly shows that uh, this cilia has a very important role in the go and the grow of cells, of cancer especially, and that it is potentially important to for us to think about ways to target this uh, cilia in ways that would allow us to create new therapies that will, will then help us put the brakes on this cancer. From your perspective, when you look at the microenvironment, this is just as a sort of a, as a teaser of what is gonna come in the future. And if you look at a cancer, now we now understand that this cancer, even though people think the cancer is heterogeneous all over the place, the reality is that it's like a country. It's got different states, different regions, mountains, peaks, weathers, 
everything is going on in a cancer. So what's going on in the North Pole may be very different than what is going on in the South Pole in these cancers. How do you think this cilia and cilia therapy may actually help us, one, understand that, and number two, target in the future to be able to have a positive effect on these cancers? Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. So I think you are absolutely spot on. So for example, um, you know, I showed you earlier when we when when I started the talk how for many cells, including many cancer cells, um, the primary cilia need to essentially get broken down and rebuilt every cell cycle in order for the cell to go through G two M. Obviously, this is very important for cancer. One of the things that we're beginning to learn is that when you look at the populations of cells that express these so-called, um, you know, glioma sort of stem cell like uh, profile, and you compare that to the active cells, um, their ciliary profile is, is actually uh, different, right? And so one of the theories is that um, that we're actually designing uh, um, and just starting now an in vivo experiment to really get after is this idea that you might have the cell, a portion of the cell, uh, a portion of cells within the tumor, the vast majority perhaps, that are able to repress their cilia to go through cycling. And these cells are the ones that will specifically be more sensitive to things like chemotherapy radiation. But what we find is that senescence, the G0 cells, the cells that are stem-like in nature, these cells tend to express their primary cilia. And by definition, are going to be um, less sensitive to the treatments that we use. Um, And so one idea is that perhaps if we were able to target the cilia, um, we would get rid of the pool of cells that lead to the recurrence, right? Um, And so we're designing some experiments now to really test that idea, but that goes precisely to your point that, you know, within the North of the country, the South of the country, to borrow your, your, your example, you might have different populations and subpopulations that are doing different things at different times. And so we are doing a number of things, including, you know, single cell analysis, um, lots of geospatial work to really try to understand this. But this is what we are thinking at the at the current time. Thanks so much. We have. Go ahead. We have a couple of questions from from the big guy. So Hugo, please go ahead. (laughs) <laughs> thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, thank you, Desmond. That was a very nice, very intriguing presentation, very beautiful work. Um, I wonder if you've looked into whether these uh, modifications are progressive through the development of the tumor and in response to different treatments, etc. Do you see changes in the um, expression levels or, or, or difference in the cilia in response to treatment or through the progression of the disease? Yeah, that's a great question. So that that goes back to what I was just uh, saying, that one of the things we can see is that as we give treatment pressures, um, so, you know, we use our irradiator in the lab or, you know, chemotherapy and irradiation, try to mimic um, the, the sort of treatment pressures. What we find is that the population moves to a more ciliated phenotype and that that phenotype uh, actually expresses things like SOX2 and OC4 and, and, and Nestin and some of those markers, CD100, that are associated uh, with a more stem-like phenotype. So that's what we're seeing. And we're now assessing whether we're, we're able to see that in patients uh, depending on when they are relative to their treatment, right? Um, and so that's something that we are definitely trying to follow how that changes over time and how we can essentially tap into that um, to make patients that are um, to, to, to increase sensitivity to treatment. And do you think that is a, a selection process or are the cells actually changing? Maybe a subpopulation of the cells are more um, able to modify their, their cilia and respond to the, to the treatment. Yeah, I mean, I think right now the the simplest sort of um, mathematical modeling for me would be a process where 
because of the advantages that are conferred by having the cilia, that it's more of a selective uh, thing. Um, and all the data I have suggests that might be the case. Um, and I think regardless, if we have great ways of, you know, um, targeting that population, targeting the cilia and the ciliated population, then we find that we can also increase, at least in vitro so far, the sensitivity to these treatments when, and render them more sensitive. Um, so, you know, um, so I think it's a selective process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think we're almost on time, but we have another question, Paula, you have one? I know I had a question, but I think uh, Dr. Brown responded it when Dr. Q asked about it. Um, it was just, um, we are seeing some differences between uh, the margin and the core. And Dr. Q and I were discussing that the margin cells are more stem-like, um, but you already said that you were interested in doing like some single cell. Uh, maybe we can talk about this offline, but we can send you some cells from the margin um, and we can try some of the differences between those areas. Yeah, that would be fantastic. All right, wonderful. Yeah. Rodrigo, thank you. Desmond, yes. amazing work. It is just uh, at one point we had over 101 participants from 14 different countries. And we thank you all for coming from around the world, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Ghana, India, Italy, Mexico, Panama, Philippines, Saudi Arabia, Spain, Venezuela, and of course, many people from the United States. We thank you from around the world for believing that together we can make a better world, that we can unravel the mysteries that have made this cancer so untreatable. And I think there's so much work going on behind the scenes. You saw a presentation from Rodrigo about the updates. Every week we do this, we learn from you and we try to make sure that uh, your voice is amplified in this platform. And Des, of course, we thank you immensely for spending the time. I saw that uh, 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 Andres put the schedule right there. Uh, Des is gonna meet with the residents right now, probably there after this, there's another link. Then he's gonna be with Dr. Nat Meyer, Dr. Chen, Dr. Chaichana, Dr. Abori, and then he's gonna be with Dr. Buchanan, Dr. Freeman, and Dr. Pierce. Then he's going to meet uh, with the research fellows from 9 to 9.30, and then I'm going to wrap it up from 9.30 to 9.45, Desmond. This is our uh, schedule. We thank you for dedicating your morning, taking away from your family. I'm sure you did not see the kids going to school or starting school, actually, at your house, and uh, we thank you for that. It takes a great amount of dedication, passion, commitment, patient care, and what you have done through the years is truly amazing to see this work and to know that we're collaborating, that we're learning from you. More than collaborate, we're learning from you. Sending cells back and forth, understanding these mechanisms will allow us to think about this disease in ways in which we can use multiple attacks, multiple ways to attack in this cancer. So we thank you, Des. Thanks so much so for having proud me. proud of you. My pleasure. Thank so you. proud of everything that you're doing. So everybody have a great day. We'll see you guys on Friday. Many people around the world and uh, we'll see you in the next links, Des. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.